go for it. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for watching and tuning in for our um, pop-up presentations that we're having right now. I'm, my name is Carrie, and I'm here with my coworker, Elizabeth, and we're going to be making a presentation about sensory diets. Um, so just a quick background, we are occupational therapists who work at Sensational Development in Massapequa, New York. Um, we are a pediatric outpatient sensory integration clinic. Uh, we service children birth um, all the way through young adulthood. We treat a variety of diagnoses, but um, our passion and our focus is typically on the sensory processing aspect. Um, and we really want to educate you and help you um, today about sensory diets. What are they and how can you implement one for your child? So we'll start with what is a sensory diet? So by definition, a sensory diet is an occupational therapy intervention strategy that is devised to attain and maintain an optimal arousal level throughout the day. A sensory diet consists of carefully planned programs of specific sensory based activities that are scheduled according to each child's needs and each family's routines and resources. So, you know, a long definition, but essentially what a sensory diet does is it allows um, us to feed our sensory system um, through certain activities throughout our day so that we can function and meet our daily needs of what needs to be done each day. Um, so typically, our question is, does a sensory diet mean food? So Elizabeth, if you want to take that away. A sensory diet does not mean food, um, but as Carrie touched upon, the reason the word diet is used is because it's trying to get into the mindset that these are necessary things that your body needs to thrive. So just like a diet full of nutrition, um, your body needs that to function the right way and to have um, a healthy body your sensory system needs a sensory diet of the right combination of inputs to help you maintain that optimal arousal level. Um, so a sensory diet consists of specific elements designed to meet your child's sensory integration needs, similar to a diet designed for nutritional needs. Um, and as Carrie said, it's nutrition for your central nervous system. So the sensory diet is based on the principle that controlled sensory input can affect what you're able to do functionally. Um, so that's why it has to be really about like your child's needs and it's the right combination, which is different for every person. And then from the last slide, we talked about how the sensory diet helps maintain an optimal arousal level. Um, but it's important to think about that optimal arousal level doesn't just mean that you're sitting and you're ready for anything all the time. Sometimes your arousal level is going to go up and that's appropriate. Um, I like to picture a kid at one of those trampoline parks, like it's appropriate for you to be bouncing and jumping and very excited, but then are you able to come back and during, you know, the party where you're having your lunch, can you sit and, and maintain that arousal level to eat and then switch back? So that's optimal switching back and forth. So meeting, meeting the task, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so what a sensory diet usually consists of, um, or how do you start a sensory diet? So it is created by a skilled occupational therapist. Um, you know, we, we really take our time to make sure, again, that it's tailored to the child. Um, so typically it is used by children or adults who have sensory processing difficulties. Um, we like to think of it as a proactive approach as opposed to reactive. Um, and again, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later as well, but just in a sense that a sensory diet, it should be a consistent part of your day. Um, it shouldn't be something that, you know, you're just going to do after you're feeling like you have to bring that arousal level back down or your child's unable to sit. And then yes, it will help to do those activities, but really um, just in a more proactive way is really where we're going to see the most neurological change happen. Um, and typically it's going to consist of sensory input, whether that be proprioception. Um, and just, just to kind of sum up really quickly, if you missed our sensory processing presentation yesterday, we did do a whole presentation that describes all the sensory systems. So it might be really helpful to go back to that. Um, but proprioception is that heavy work um, going to the deep muscles, very calming 
It consists of vestibular input, so some movement um, activities. It can consist of oral motor strategies, tactile, auditory, visual. So really we'll target all the sensory systems. Um, it also might include some environmental modifications. So, you know, trying to meet, depending on what environment they are in, we might have to, you know, create a smaller space. We might have to bring in different tools, um, you know, decrease visuals. So a lot of things that we can do in the environment. And then as well as transition strategies. So really important um, to help and not just, you know, to have a smooth transition and being able to create these activities to allow for, um, you know, a, a smooth onto the next activity um, kind of thing. So a lot of our kids do have difficulties with transition. So we incorporate that into our sensory diet. So the key points of a sensory diet, what we like to look at is not only the type of input, but also these three factors. Um, the first is the frequency. So the frequency with which a type of sensory input is provided. How often am I going to do that task? Um, the duration, how long does my child need to engage in the activity? And then the intensity, does my child need the input to be more intense or less intense? So when we establish a sensory diet in the beginning, it might take some tweaking. It's a lot of problem solving and something might work one day and then it might not work the next. Um, and that's where what Carrie was hitting on about the environmental factors and the transition into whatever spaces you're going into are all going to require um, a clinical eye, which your therapist can help you to look at. You know, this sensory diet, this combination of input worked really well before we went to the park, but it did not work before we went to a block party. And then your therapist can help you figure out maybe what is setting your child off, or if you're an adult, what's setting yourself off um, in that environment. And then we'll tweak, maybe try doing the sensory diet more times a day, or make the input more intense. So instead of rocking back and forth in a rocking chair, let's try a little bit of spinning, activating the vestibular system in a more intense way, and then monitoring closely um, the changes that happen finding that just right fit for your child and then moving forward with that until we need to tweak it again. Yeah, and I feel like just a big thing that we always get is, you know, we, we try and educate as much as we can and we'll educate on, you know, we're gonna do um, frog jumps to the car to help with transitions. And a parent might come back and say, well, that, that didn't do anything, you know, that didn't help them. Um, so just doing it once, you know, we have to go back and look, was it the right frequency, the right duration, the right intensity? So do we have to do frog jumps before and after the car? You know, do we have to do it more times in a day? So there's a lot of things that, you know, like the example says, just blowing a whistle five times, um, you know, it may not help, but it's about how much we do it and about what type of, like when in the day that it's getting done. Um, so most importantly, how do we implement it? So um, here at Sensational Development, we like to get a daily schedule of key events. So we would give the parent something, a chart like this to fill out because it's really important to know what is happening in the child's day. We see children for 30, 45 to an hour. Um, so we don't see, we, we only get a snapshot of the child. We have to know what's going on throughout the entire day. So we'll give this to the parent. We'll say, you know, pick a typical day. Sometimes we'll have them do one for a weekday, one for a weekend um, day. And that way they can fill this out with the time, you know, what, when they wake up, what time do they wake up? What is their performance or their arousal during this activity? So are they really sleepy when they wake up? Are they really excited? Um, do they have a hard time transitioning and going to breakfast? Do they have a hard time getting dressed in the morning depending on the day? So then what, we'll, you know, as the therapist, we will kind of look at that. And then the next column would be our sensory diet activity suggestions about what strategies, what exercises can be done in order to help make that transition more smooth. So the um, suggestions would be, um, you know, the following. Do you want to go through that, Elizabeth? Sure. And I was just going to say about the how we implement it. When you talk about the schedule, the purpose is not to disrupt your family's routine. It's to work in conjunction with what's already established. So 
we want to always acknowledge that often, you know, we're working with someone who is part of a bigger picture. So maybe you're coming to us, one child needs a sensory diet, and you're also trying to get three kids out the door to school, um, or you're an adult trying to fit it into a busy work schedule. Um, we want to find ways to make it really easy. So maybe the your child can pull their younger sibling on a blanket, and then you're having both of them engaged in something, or as an adult, we'll cue you to try and do a sensory diet activity right after you brush your teeth on your way out the door. Uh, finding ways to fit it into what already works, not to say that it's not one size fits all. Um, and that's important to remember as we go through the suggestions, there's a long list of activities. We just wanna make sure that you have access to things that you might wanna try before you can get in touch with your OT or reach out to us to work and make something more specific. Um, but you always need a lot of options because not one thing is gonna work for every child and not one thing is gonna work all the time. So for the activity suggestions, this page is all about deep pressure or heavy work, which is tied to that proprioceptive input that Carrie mentioned earlier. Um, there's a long list here, but including things like trampolines, um, wheelbarrow walking, Anytime that you're bearing weight through a joint or pushing and pulling something heavy, that's the overall umbrella idea for heavy work. Um, so with the trampoline, you're getting that nice heavy work into your ankles. With the wheelbarrow walk, you're getting it into all of your upper extremity. Um, carrying something heavy is a great way to do this. I always love recommending including your child in chores because a lot of times it's fun and it gives their body a lot of what it needs. Um, pushing in chairs, carrying laundry, um, making a sandwich. So putting your child between a bunch of pillows and kind of, I'll tell parents to add condiments on top, like pushing over, you're adding mustard, you're adding turkey, whatever you ate for lunch. Um, and that's a really fun way to keep the child engaged while you're giving them the input they can think about what's going on in their sandwich. So then, you know, not just the proprioceptive activities, that's what we look at a lot, um, because they are so calming and regulating for most children. But we also have to think about all the other sensory systems and what other, um, you know, tricks that we can pull out that are going to really, again, access that central nervous system so that we can reach that optimal arousal level and maintain that optimal arousal level to match the daily activity. Um, so that can be an oral motor activity. Oral motor is very calming. It actually um, provides a lot of proprioception through the mouth. So thinking about a baby and sucking, um, that it's very soothing. Um, so sometimes we'll have a child, you can make ice pops. We make our own ice pops with organic juice and water, um, you know, trying to reduce some of the sugar, but keeping them, you know, they're, they're useful. They really are. Um, chewing on something resistive, thinking those crunchy, chewy snacks, really helping, um, you know, activating the proprioceptive um, receptors in your jaw and in your mouth. Um, vestibular input, and again, another really calming type of input is typically linear. So, you know, back and forth movement, rocking chair swings, um, but at the same time, a lot of vestibular inputs can also be achieved through proprioceptive activities um, that we just talked about such as the trampoline, um, you know, pulling someone on a blanket, you're also getting some of that movement. Um, and again, a lot of parents will say, well, we don't have the swings that you guys have at the clinic, what can we do? Um, so log rolling um, for your little ones, if you have, you know, both parents available to put them into a blanket and kind of rock them in the blanket. Um, tumble salts, again, jumping, that's also providing some of that vestibular input. Um, and of course, that proprioceptive system that we just talked about, and also thinking about your visual system. What, what is your visual system taking in? So typically, you know, if you're in a bright room, lots of colors, you're kind of, um, that will stimulate you a little bit more than if you were in a dim room, you dim the lights, you know, right before bed, trying to calm down. Um, so you're going, again, kind of an environmental modification you can do, um, you know, playing inside a tent, making smaller spaces are typically more calming um, and more controlled for a child. And then again, the auditory system, um, very calming sound, sounds of nature are typically calming um, and very grounding. Um, soft music, lullaby. So again, thinking about what you can do in the environment to access all of the sensory systems.
The, this next slide is about environmental modifications. So we touched on that briefly, that that's an important part of a sensory diet, not only the input that you're giving to your child or allowing your child to seek out, but also what's going on around them. So there's a lot that we can look at um, when possible, possible. We always wanna modify the environment to reduce or increase sensory stimuli that will impact a child's response. Um, so some, some children need a reduction. They wanna see not busy walls, not a lot hanging, not a lot, you know, you don't want the TV on in the background, maybe no background music if they're trying to focus. Well, other children or adults, they might want that intensity to help them focus. They might need background noise or they might need a break for music. They might do well with a lot to look at, um, kind of filling their cup up with that input in order to help them focus. Whereas other kids that might make their cup kind of overflow and then they're not able to do what you need them to do. So that's an important example about really meeting that person where they're at, finding the right combination. But some things to think about are having calming music in the car or what kind of music you're playing that works well, having less toys in the playroom. So trying to take out certain toys every week, maybe having like a rotation so that they're playing, they're actually looking at what's available. Um, sometimes playrooms can be really overwhelming because there's so many great toys that then we end up not playing or only going to the same three every time accessibility to cushions and blankets to have that break if we do start to feel overwhelmed a lot of times people will show us what they need so they'll start you know building a little fort or hiding under games that you wanted them to play hiding under the couch under people's legs things like that avoiding crowded um, public environments which is more important now than ever but definitely to think about as as a rule if you're going into some place that's very busy um, things like a birthday party, a big family event, even, you know, going to the mall or the grocery store, there's a lot of input coming, coming at you when you go out into those environments. So when possible, try to avoid that if it's a trigger, but if it's not possible, then there are a lot of strategies you can do to help set someone up for success going out into the environment. Using a visual timer, um, that can help to just clearly define how long you'll be in that situation if it's difficult or to help the child know how long they'll have to engage in the activity you set up for them before they have to transition. Um, so that's a great transition tool. And then using a visual schedule or first then picture cards um, to help the child know what's going to happen after they're doing this or what they're about to walk into. So a lot of times if environments in general tend to be overwhelming, helping define their expectations will help with some of that reaction because the big picture of all of this, as we mentioned earlier, is just calming that central nervous system. So we're able to do what we need to do. Um, and preparation is one of the best kind of proactive strategies for that. So some of those sensory tools that you can bring out, um, you know, because your family really loves to go to a restaurant or you need to bring the kids to the grocery store. Um, so you need to help your child cope, um, you know, that those environments are too overwhelming. So things such as noise canceling headphones, um, a weighted vest, a weighted lap head or a weighted blanket are all really great things. Um, a, a lot of my kids, um, our parents will tell me that they bring those to the movies or to a show that they're going to, um, just to kind of have a little bit more of that grounded feeling for the child. Um, fidgets are also a great tool, um, you know, to use. There's so many different kinds of fidgets. Again, every child is unique, so they might gravitate towards different fidgets, but there's ones, you know, you can keep your fingers busy. I want, you know, the big thing was the fidget spinners and, um, you know, those are definitely all great tools and remembering that they're a tool and not a toy, um, you know, which is really important for to teach the child and to educate them, especially I know in school, that's a big thing that comes up. But, you know, the more that we introduce that, that this is a sensory tool. And if it's a toy, then we have to take it away. So kind of educating again about fidgets, um, the oral motor tools and items. So again, um, even as adults, you know, chewing gum is very calming and organizing. If I'm sitting here, you know, doing a report and I'm for an extended amount of time, sometimes I'll chew some gum or I'll have my coffee and straw nearby. A lot of children will benefit from, you know, a, a chewy necklace. We have necklaces um, that can be put around their neck so that they don't lose them or even um, at the tops of their pencils. 
And then lastly, um, a baseball hat or sunglasses. Those will help with the visual um, stimuli. So that kind of blocks out, kind of gives you a little bit of a blinder for anything that's really too overwhelming. Um, so that is another really great strategy that we have found to be successful. Again, even the sunglasses, if it's a room that is so really bright, then sunglasses will kind of help dim that light and kind of keep, you know, a little bit more calm. And I think the most important thing when you're being given these tools, whether they're for yourself or for your child, is to understand the why behind the recommendation. Because if you do find yourself in a situation where you can't control the environment, you want to know what's in your toolbox and not just start pulling out, you know, sunglasses are probably not going to be the most effective strategy if you're overwhelmed in the grocery store. For some people it might be, but that you don't just want to try anything anytime. Um, you want to know that you did everything you could in prep for that. So educated on the routine and doing it every day. And then also the why piece of like, well, I know that when my child gets overwhelmed, doing heavy work helps. And then now I'm in the grocery store, maybe I'll take them out and have them push the cart. So then empowering you because you're the expert on your child or yourself um, to know what to use when. So hopefully you feel empowered to, to problem solve in that moment. And then however it goes, you can report back and, and maybe we'll have some kind of other recommendation um, to add to your toolbox, but always knowing the why so you don't get lost in, in just the list of recommendations. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, so I just wanted to share an example of a sensory diet that I had created. Um, this was a parent who filled out um, the chart and then brought it back. And then I kind of added some of the sensory diet suggestions. So as you can see, you know, when the child woke up, they're very active, hiding under the covers. Mom's trying to get her out of the house and it's a big struggle. Um, so I suggest suggested um, doing some pillow squishes in the morning, um, helping her, you know, crash and kind of, again, activating that proprioceptive system. Um, big bear hugs, making a, you know, a, a carry sandwich and kind of squeezing her. Um, we also, some with this, particular child utilize a brushing protocol, um, which is another strategy um, that we occupational therapists use to provide that deep pressure um, and that calming input. And, you know, just making a comment that typically the deep pressure is very calming as opposed to, you know, if you, you're trying to squeeze the child and you're shaking the pillow a lot, like that actually might be more arousing. So kind of that sustained deep pressure. Um, so again, she was resistant to getting dressed. She was yelling, screaming. She only wears two pairs of shoes. So what I suggested was, again, giving her those preparatory activities before getting dressed, such as the brushing and the um, deep input. And then also giving a choice, which is really important. Um, you know, I could have said also a visual schedule of this is what's going to happen, but this was a very young child. So we just decided that two different choices that she can choose from to give her some more control um, would be really helpful in getting dressed. And then again, thinking about those transitions, the mom said that was a really hard time for them was transitioning to the car. Um, so she added that into her schedule. Um, this child was very resistant. Uh, so what we did was, again, we gave her some preparatory activities. She was carrying heavy items to the car or even carrying her mother's car keys, giving her a sense of control of knowing, okay, well, I have the keys and we're walking to the car. So this is, you know, mom needs the keys. But once we get to the car, like, this is what's going to happen. We're going to drive and we're going to go to school. Um, so kind of, again, giving a sense of control and also very that visual schedule of where they're going and a weighted blanket for her lap. So a kind of a combination of all the strategies we talked about. And then while in the car, some calming music um, that will help set up that environment and keep her calm in the car. So is my child always going to need a sensory diet? Um, this is a question I feel like we all get very often. If you start implementing these strategies, are you going to have to do it all the time forever? Um, and the first answer um, is to keep in mind that many of us as adults have our own sensory diets, even if they're not labeled as that. We implement in our daily routines to help us feel our best. Um, people who go to the gym or exercise before starting the day. I've heard from so many adults and some of my peers, they just don't feel right if they don't get up and move in the morning. Um, using standing desks because you're having trouble sitting all day. 
especially now with a lot of people working from home, having to adapt, you know, where they're sitting to do work, adding snacks or taking a bathroom break, um, having a beverage. As Carrie said, she always has, you know, her coffee with a straw, especially if she's sitting for a long time. We're very fortunate, especially for someone who needs movement, that we get to move around all day and, and do these sensory diet activities with the people that we work with. Um, but on those days where we're, we're writing reports, we're definitely pulling out all the strategies for ourselves, um, using rolling chairs and adding in movement breaks as needed. I know that there's a lot of kind of movements, even for adults, like try and take the stairs or try and get a desk that's far from the coffee machine. So you're getting that walking in your day. And a lot of that I think is framed as, you know, a health movement, which it definitely is important to move, but it also helps your, your sensory systems to be able to focus. Um, ideally with the implementation of a sensory diet and changing it as needed um, and supporting support from the adults in our lives, children will usually start to change and continue their sensory diets on their own. Um, they may participate in extracurriculars that meet their needs, know when to retreat and what supports they should keep at the ready. So our goal is for joy and meaning in life and to empower children to be able to self-regulate, to feel in control of their bodies and know that they are amazing just as they are. Um, so with all of that, it just means that we're trying to teach these kids what they need to feel their best. So over time of implementing the sensory diet, um, you know, during our sessions and then at home, hopefully they're able to identify like after I do this, I feel better and then I have a good day at school. Um, and that's the coolest thing when you have someone come in who used to have these outbursts, even if they're still happening, they're able to tell you, well, I, I felt really overwhelmed because the fire alarm went off at the restaurant I was at, or I got really upset because the kid next to me in line kept hitting my back and, you know, maybe not in the moment. And then over time, they're able to identify it in the moment and register what they need to do. Um, and so that's a really important reminder that a lot of adults have these strategies. You've just learned what works for you and we're just helping in that process. So it continues through the life course. So again, just to kind of sum it up, some things to remember is that every child is unique and every child has different sensory preferences. So, you know, a child can present in the same way. And if I look at them, um, you know, they're, they both really love movement and they have difficulty with attention. But if I kind of break down those, both of those children um, and really clinically assess, then typically I will find that even though one child really, the pushing the weighted basket back and forth and making a game out of it works for one child, the next child is like this, that's not going to work for me. Um, you know, so they're, they'll either be avoidant to it or they'll try that activity and their body is not quite regulated yet. So we have to find something new. So it's constantly um, seeing what the child is interested in. A lot of what we do in the clinic is kind of letting the child be self-directed because children usually seek out what they need. Um, and that way we can help structure it and then hopefully simulate that at home. Um, so again, is your child over aroused, under aroused? Um, again, lots of um, sensory processing definitions here, but um, essentially your therapist will be able to help you and educate you and determine what activities are best for your child so that they can attain and maintain, which is what is most important, maintaining that appropriate arousal level. Um, to another thing we get is that, you know, what works one day may not work the next day and that's okay. Um, you know, so pushing the weighted bucket back and forth before dinner really helped the child be able to sit and attend to mealtime last night. Then tonight we tried that same activity and the child just wasn't ready for mealtime. So it could be a variety of reasons whether or not um, they needed more intensity that day, um, you know, that wasn't an intense enough activity, or something happened in that day where the child, I know Elizabeth mentioned, you know, filling up the cup and that child cup was overflowed that day and we need more activities or a different type of calming activity before dinner. So um, it definitely fluctuates and that's why we want to empower you um, with as much knowledge and education and activities so that you can say in that moment, 
that didn't work. What can we, what can we do? What can we switch gears to? Um, so maybe, maybe let's, let's animal walk before dinner instead, or maybe they need um, to just go sit in the corner with a more quiet space. So again, giving those tools, so you can quickly switch gears. Um, that proactive versus reactive approach um, that we discussed in the beginning. So really, a sensory diet has to be done consistently. We really need it to be proactive. Um, so before we're seeing any difficulties and that way we can hopefully avoid um, those problem areas and those difficult transitions um, as opposed to that reactive. And of course, there's always gonna be a time where you need those tools and you need to be reactive, but the goal is to activate that central nervous system and to make those true neurological changes. Um, again, we touched on making it natural. This should be something that's easily flowing into your daily routine. Again, why we fill out the key events chart so that way we can kind of have it flow. We, we don't want it to be like, okay, well, 10 o'clock, we, we need to go do some bear walks right now. Um, you know, it can kind of just be like, well, we're going to the car, let's go do the bear walks so or we're transitioning. So thinking about how you can kind of make it a flow and not always, um, so demanding, because I do find a lot of times if it becomes more of a demand as opposed to in the natural routine, then the children kind of see it as a, a chore, something they have to do. Um, and then you can get some avoidance there, but um, really making it fun, making it natural and thinking about what the child likes and enjoys. Um, and then last but not least, we have to collaborate. Um, we are a team. You have to communicate with your therapist, um, tell them that this activity didn't work that day, or can you help me come up with a new activity? Um, and definitely we love to reach out to teachers to help with implementing a sensory diet for the classroom as well as for home. So it's for every single environment and we really have to collaborate as a team um, between the parents, other professionals, and anybody else working with the child. Um, and with the child, you know, collaborating with them saying, hey, like, how did your body feel after we just, you know, spun around 10 times? Like, did that make your engine level really high or really low? So kind of helping them and educating them um, with how their body is feeling and being in touch with that so they can take ownership and be more independent with their sensory diet. Anything else you want to add to that, Elizabeth? Um, just to touch on it one other way, when you talk about the importance of consistency, um, engaging in it every day, that's what's going to make it proactive. And thinking about it's not only a strategy to help you that day, but the more that someone engages in the sensory activities they need, you're actually rewiring the brain and building new pathways to help your brain process that better. Um, so it's kind of a long term and a short term investment just doing these these things every day, because you're going to see that it's going to change their daily routine over time of engaging with it. And then you're helping in the big picture um, to change their brain to process this better. So it kind of is twofold there. And that's uh, a really important answer to that question of if you'll always need it. There are always going to be sensory needs that you'll have to adapt to. But investing in it now, um, when the children are young, it's going to help with their confidence and empower them to be able to do it, you know, long term, figure out what works while also improving the system at the same time. So that is the end. Remembering consistency is key. Once you start, it will become more natural and you'll be able to understand what your child needs and when. Um, and then it just had a few helpful links, um, you know, of course, uh, sensationaldevelopment.com, that is our website. You can kind of go on there, subscribe to our newsletter, um, follow us on social media, reach out to us, ask us any questions um, that you might have or any concerns for your child. We're here to help and we wanna help you in creating um, your sensory diet and making that successful for your child. Um, the SPD Star Foundation, um, Sensational Brain, Fun and Function, they have a lot of those sensory tools that we were talking about. Um, and then, you know, one other thing I wanted to, well, do we have any questions? I think, I don't know. We have, One question that we have been having right now is, or coming up frequently is with children going back to school right now, 
they're not allowed to have or they're saying their movement is very restrictive. Um, so a lot of children we see, they have 504 plans, so accommodations, or they have an IEP that will allow them to have various accommodations such as movements, um, sensory diets. So we just recently had a parent tell us that there's no movement in the classroom um, because of all the protocols that are being put in place. So now we have to kind of, you know, first of all, collaborate with that teacher about the importance of continuing that movement. And, you know, we understand that, you know, this is a very rare situation um, and we have to keep everyone safe, but these children need their movement. So if we can do things in the chair, um, you know, we like to do chair push-ups, trying to put your hand on the chair and pushing your bottom up, um, pushing your hands together, having access to those fidgets and other tools and really kind of finding out when your child can take those breaks um, so that they are getting the movement that they need. Um, so that's really important. And again, really important for you to advocate for your child. Um, and if you have any other questions about that or about sensory diets at all, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you can email us at info at sensationaldevelopment.com. Thank you for watching our presentation. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you soon.